Uh, so my name is Dennis and my wife Lynette, we come from uh, Palmerston Church, it's where we normally go, the main church, it's three in Palmerston but we go to the main one. Um, now I, for those who um, don't know me, I, I, I've done quite a lot with Warren Strawbridge and different things and outreach. We go up town usually most weeks, um, sharing our faith, meeting all sorts of people and enjoy doing that. And Warren used to um, come to the prison um, on Sunday with us, and um, he has come out on the street band, but you know, not so keen on that, it's late at night. So I'd just like to say to you before I start, now if any of you would like to come to the prison with us to get involved with prison ministry in, at Linton, um, you just approach me and um, I'll have a talk to you. It's just like going into... But um, we go into the room where they normally have um, their meals, uh, and it's just like a Sabbath school. I, I, I quite enjoy going there because, you know, without the grace of God, I could be in there. All of us could be in there without the grace of God. And um, the other thing um, I invite you, if you're interested, um, the street band, we do it once every, I think it's seven weeks, is it? Seven weeks? Uh, when, once it gets going again, and so we go out in the street and we give um, give away food and drinks and talk with the guys on the street. Yeah, um, I've been doing it for um, quite a few years, and it's um, you know it's a Christian influence um, in a hard environment. So yes, if you're interested, just talk to me um, after. Now. The subject I was told about, that you, you're going through the fundamentals in, of our church, 28, 28 now, the fundamentals, and this one is about growing in Christ. So this is the subject that I'm talking about in the children's story from Lorraine. Um, very good. It's very good. So um, <coughs> I'll just get myself organised. Um, yeah, to see if this works, yes, right. So I invite you um, to turn in your Bibles um, to um, Ephesians, Ephesians 2. <coughs> It'll be on the PowerPoint too. Um, I'll just get it here. So Ephesians 2, um, 8 to 10. which is very well known verses. So, um, so I'd just like to say a prayer. Like say a prayer. Just invite you to be over here. Father in heaven, we, <coughs> we just thank you, Lord, that we can study the word in, in peace, Lord, in this country. But Lord, without your spirit, um, the word of God will not reach us. We need the Spirit of God here, Lord. So lead us to Jesus, Lord. That song, look unto Jesus. He's the answer. And we just uh, thank you for Jesus, Lord. We thank you for your Spirit. We thank you that you love each of us and that you're for us. You want us in your kingdom. So be with us here now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Ephesians 2. Um, 8 to 10, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared before that we should walk in them. So we're saved by grace through faith, Faith, and that's the gift of God. Even faith's the gift of God. Um, not of works, nothing that we can do to save ourselves. But then, when we are in a saved relationship, we are um, God's workmanship. Right? God's workmanship. Now, the other verse um, 
is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 10. So 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 10. Just get yourself organised up here. <coughs> Right, oh, I love this verse. So it says here, for by, gra uh, for by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I laboured more abundantly than all, than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was, was with me. Oh, that's Paul became the greatest of the apostles. Right? But it was the grace of God working in him, and it wasn't in vain. Now, <clears throat> if we're going to grow in grace, we need uh, the grace of God in our lives. We definitely need the grace of God. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. And we need to understand what it is, you know. <laughs> we do. So that for... You know, I could take a, a talk on each of these points, but um, what does a person look like? So the first point, what does a person look like when they have grown up and mature, um, full of the grace of God? What does a person look like? They look like Jesus. Um, the, the second point, why do we need the grace of God? Why do we need it? How do we receive the grace of God? And then how... How do we grow in grace or how do we grow in Christ? So what does a person look like when they're mature or full of grace? Now, and I think it was six of us, Lorraine, uh, myself and my wife and um, the sergeants and uh, Suzanne Mackay, we went on the Reformation tour. And you come to a place called, um, uh, what was it, Oxford, wasn't it? Oxford, and you've got this huge statue there, and <clears throat> the statues of three men, three men, which is um, Latimer, Ridley, and um, Cran Cranmer, I think that's how you say it, he was the first Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, when you... Um, hang on, when you go down the, down that road and you turn into here, see on the spot there, that's where they burnt uh, Ridley and um, Latimer, Mary. This is the time of uh, King Henry VIII's um, daughter. So Henry VIII had kicked out the um, Catholic Church, taken over the churches and started the Church of England. And um, Mary, when he died, and um, then there was Edward I can't remember, it would be, I can't remember, and then his daughter. And she wanted to turn the church back to the Catholic Church. And she thought if she could get rid of a thousand people, she thought, you know, then she could do it. And so slowly she um, started to get rid of them and she burned them, burned them alive, you know. So on that spot there, um, well, hang on, go back a bit. On the wall, just over from where that spot was on the road, is this sign here. Um, so Latimer and Ridley were burnt there on, on, that, um, on that spot. Now, if you go back to the end of the, um, the road and then along a bit, there's a church. This is the church. And there's a tower there, a tower. And Mary kept the three of them in that tower. Three of them in the tower. And then, now she she burnt Latimer and Ridley first, and it's 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 interesting what they said when they. I'll just read you from Great Controversy. He said Latimer and his fellow martyrs Ridley, as the flames were about to silence the, their voice, said, "We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England." As I trust, it shall never be put out. Right. Now that's a very mature attitude, isn't it? Right. Getting burnt and you know burnt for their faith. Now, 
Cranman, he was in that tower and looking down and um, his faith weakened, his trust in God weakened and um, he signed, you know, he would recant. Right. But later on, he, he uh, recanted from his recant, <laughs> recanting. So um, Mary was determined to burn him, and so um, the next year, 1556, she burned him. But I don't know how this works. He burned his hand. He held his hand. He was so ashamed of what he did. He held his hand over the fire and burnt his hand off before um, his body was burnt. You know? Now, how does a man do that, you know? He was scared in the first place, you know? But um, God gave him the strength, you know? He held his hand there and burnt it and he was burnt. Now, I want to tell you about another person you've probably never heard of. Um, well, you may have. Um, is a, a John Bradford. It's not the one that we see on the on the TV. This is um, the same time. Now he was kept in that tower for some time too, and he was burnt too. But I just love his attitude. And you know, if I'm faced with it, or if you were faced with it, we would want to be like these people. This is real maturity. Now. This is what John um, Bradford said, the Mardu, speaking of Queen Mary, at whose cruel mercy he had laid, he said, if Mary be pleased to release me, I will thank her. If she will imprison me, I will thank her. If she will burn me, I will thank her. Let God, let God do with me what he will, I will be thankful. Isn't that a wonderful attitude? See, God is sovereign over our life. Everything that comes into our life, God has a reason. He has a reason. Now, we don't understand, but God is sovereign. And if we can really believe that, no matter what comes in, we can trust God. Lord, what are you doing in my life, you know? Um, and he said here, in the afternoon um, before he was to be burned, uh, the, the next day he was to be burned, and the keeper's wife came to announce the dreadful news to him. But to John, he excited only thankfulness to God. What a wonderful attitude, eh? It's, it's, it's real grace, isn't it, you know? So, um, <clears throat> yes, that's what, a mature, that's what mature people are, are like. Now, why do we need grace? Why do we need grace? Well, let me explain to you that. Now, it's important. I, I believe this for a long time, but I brought a book up camp called um, The End Time Events in Last Generation. And this is what it said. It is important to recognise that an inadequate doctrine of sin will lead to an inadequate doctrine of salvation. We need to know the, the problem, the, the disease, you know, and then we can appreciate the cure, you know. Now, he, he argues in this book um, that most Adventists define sin as a transgression of the law. And I think most people would probably see it as that, you know. So the problem with that is, is that if sin is just the transgression of the law, um, you know, just stop transgressing the law and then you'll be right. But it's, it's a bigger problem than that. See, the problem is, it's our nature. The nature is the problem, and the transgressing of the law is only the result of the nature. It's the problem. Um, now, I've got a, um, a few quotes here. Um, for instance, and I'll read this in more than one place, and it says, um, determined to know the worst of your case, you know, the worst of my case. You know, I pray that prayer sometimes. It's a bit scary to pray it. You know, the end of Psalms 139. Search me, O God. See if there be any wicked way in me. You know, and um, you know, God reminds me of some of the things I've done in the past. You know, it's quite scary. You know, but we need to know the disease. You know, to appreciate the cure. Um, it's interesting, you know, the giving of the Ten Commandments, you know, it says in Hebrews 12 that Moses was terrified, 
he was terrified. He was, I guess you would be when God spoke the law. And then in, in Exodus 24, verse 7, they, they make covenant with God. You know, all that the Lord has said we will do. They're probably too scared not to, you know. But they couldn't do it. Six weeks later, they're dancing in an orgy around the golden calf, you know, sexual immorality and party and all the rest of it. And this is what um, Patriarchs and Prophets says, the people did not realise the sinfulness of their own hearts, that without Christ it's impossible for them to keep the law of God. Before there could be any permanent reformation, the people must be led to feel their utter inability in themselves to render obedience. And that's for you and me. We need the grace of God, you know, we do. We can't live a Christian life without God. See, the problem is the, the nature. Now, these are just verses in the Bible. For instance, uh, we're transgressors from the womb. We're sinful from birth, slaves from nature. Paul said, I know and I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. And he says, I find this law at work when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. <coughs> and in that fabulous book called Acts of the Apostles, the chapter Transformed by Grace, if you haven't read it, it's just a wonderful chapter. She says, as our experience deepens, we will make Paul's confession our own, that in me there is no good thing. Right. So the nearer we come to Christ, the more we realise the problem which drives us more to Christ, who is the answer for grace. You know, that's, that's how it goes. Now these are other verses in the Bible. David said, I have no good apart from you. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy, if there's any good in you, it is from Jesus. And yourselves were incapable of doing a good thing. And this one, we, the Spirit of Prophecy, we do not even think one noble thought that does not come from him. So we're not even capable of thinking one good thought, you know? So that's the problem, see? And I, I read a book, um, oh, we down the South Island doing some hiking on Jonah. And he says there, it was a good book too, a really good book. I love the, the, um, the book of Jonah. Oh, it's full of encouragement for all of us, you know. And he says there, no human heart will learn its sinfulness by being told that it's sinful. It will have to be shown often by brutal experience. You know, like Peter is the perfect example. Isn't he? he said, you know, Jesus said, you're all going to deny me. And... But he says, I, I, I'll go to prison. I'll die for you. He meant every word of it. But that very night, he denied Christ three times. And he learned by bitter experience, you know, the, the sinfulness of the human heart. He did. And he became a great man, you know. God used him in a mighty way, you know. Same with Paul, you know. The road to the mass. He had to learn it, you know. And each of us have to learn it. So, um, it's good to realise the problem. See, thus, sin in the heart leads to sin in the daily life, or sinful actions. As a result, the answer to the sin problem is not primarily cleaning up our behaviour. Now, we go up town doing a good person test, I've got a chart, you know, and I do a good person test, and um, I, I like it, you know, it works well. And um, you ask most people after you've gone through, what do you have to do to get to heaven? And I say, well, you've got to stop doing these things. You know, they've been doing lying and stealing and blasphemy and you know, sexual sin. You've got to stop doing it. But the problem is, even if you stop that, it wouldn't solve the problem. We need a saviour, don't we? You know? Um, so after all, people can clean up their actions and still... Um, are still being sinners, you know, like um, in this book I bought um, about in times it says, we've all seen strict Sabbath keepers and health reformers that are meaner than the devil, you know. So we can be like that, can't we, you know. So it's it's not a matter of cleaning up the outside, you know. It's the heart's the problem, isn't it? 
So um, the solution to the sin problem is a radical new birth, a new heart and mind, and out of that experience flows the new way of living. The centre of the gospel is the cross of Christ and our acceptance of his sacrifice and his work on our behalf. This is the only real answer to the sin problem. Go be born again. You must be born again. It is useless to do anything else until we are born again. Now I love this statement now on what she says. It's the word of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Right. So, <clears throat> yes, well, not very exciting, <laughs> but it's the reality. It's the reality, you know. Um, see, <clears throat> Ellen White says, many who call themselves Christian are mere human moralists. Mere human moralists. Uh, see, a moralist. A moralist is a person without grace attempting to reform themselves. Now, the world is full of it. The world is full of it. All the religions, apart from true Christianity, is based on moralism. We go and do Bible in school, men or what? They want us to teach morals. You know, but without the grace of God, it's not going to change the heart. It's the same in the prison, you know. We can teach morals, but without the grace of God in the life, there's never going to be any real change and no real growth in the life, yeah. you know. It can't be. It can't be. Now, I, um, I was listening to um, a sermon, and I... Um, the, the author read a bit from this book. It's called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And this is one of the best books I've ever read. I'm on my fourth book with this guy, Thomas Brooks. He's a Puritan. He's one of the top, no, the top 30 Puritan writers. It's a wonderful book. I will, I will refer to that for the rest of my life. It is such a good book. Now, in this book, um, there's a section on page 155 for a bit, um, and it's going through, and it's showing the difference between renewing grace and restraining grace. Right? Renewing grace and restraining grace. Um, sanctifying grace and um, temporary grace. And it goes through 10 points, and it's showing the difference. Now, I thought it was so good, I got my daughter to type it out, I have it online. So if anyone wants to read that, you give me your email and I'll send it to you. Now it shows how the difference between the person who has renewing grace and who doesn't. See, God's grace is everywhere in this world. Right? This world would be, you know, when the Spirit of God is withdrawn, it's just going to be a bloodbath. It's going to be terrible. It is really going to be terrible. It will be hell on earth, you know, without the Spirit of God. See, God's Spirit is working on everyone in this world, whether believer or not, right? We cannot do anything good without the Spirit of God working in us. And it's the same with people, atheists out there, that in food banks or whatever, you know? They're doing it because the Spirit of God is working in them. Because if God didn't do that, man, this world would be terrible. It really would. We owe so much to the um, the Spirit of God. So, you know, apart from all what I've said, we must be born again to grow as a Christian. You can't. You're wasting your time, you know. Now, the scary thing, which I find, you know, we're all in the same boat, is some of the statements in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy which are frightening. I find them frightening. Now, whether it says in the Bible, Isaiah, that we God's people tremble at his word, you know. Yeah, so, you know, for instance, Matthew 24, verse 12, it says, when the crisis comes, when the crisis comes, most will give it up. It's talking about us, people, Christians, right? I hope it's none here. I hope I'm not like that when the crisis comes. You know, when forced... 
false worship is forced upon us. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 8, many will come from the east and from the west, you know, and so on, but the children of the kingdom will be cast out. Isn't that a frightening verse? It really is. And in Revelation um, 13, the latest year message, Jesus is on the outside of the church. He's not inside the church. If any man repent, you know, Jesus will come in. So that frightening statement. And then it gets even worse with Ellen White. She said, soon God's people will be tested by furious trials. And the great proportion of those who appear genuine and true will prove to be base metal. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, fight the battles when the champions of few will be a test, you know? So they're challenging statements, aren't they? They really, you know, we're all in the same boat. There's no super Christians in this um, church, you know? We all need the grace of God, you know? Soon there'll be trouble all over the earth, you know? And it will come everyone to, to seek to know God, you know? So challenging times ahead. Now, how are we born again? Now, I've got a verse here. Oh, this is a wonderful verse, this. So, Colossians 1 6. That has come to you, he's talking about the gospel, in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood the grace of God. So we must understand the grace of God. We cannot grow, cannot appreciate it, unless we understand the grace of God. Right? Right. Now, I, um, I wrote on a card an experience of Luther. Now, in Luther, Martin Luther is an interesting person. You know, he was a genius. He translated the New Testament in, what, two months from, I think it was Latin, wasn't it Latin? to um, journal. Man, you know. But he was hopeless at looking after himself. He was in debt by a um, hundred guilders, I think it was. Um, his wife straightened him out. And he was terrible. He, he wouldn't change his bed for a long time, a year or something, you know. He was terrible looking after himself. But he was a genius. And this is his experience where his conversion, and he says here about... Um, Romans 1, 16 and 17, and he says, What is the connection between the gospel, the righteousness from God, and the just shall live by faith? And he said, I hated the passage. How could God be just and yet demand from me, a sinner from conception, that I should love him? Oh, I hate God, he said. Martin saw in this passage that a righteous God demanded that we should love him with all our heart, mind, in souls. In other words, God demanded an impossibility because we're not righteous and Luther hated the inconsistency. One day the, uh, the light burst through. Martin said, the gates of paradise were thrown open. I was born anew. I found the key to the whole Bible. I saw that the righteousness of God was a gift from God. It was given into the hand of faith of all who felt their need of Jesus. This is the gospel, the good news. Then he said, I was born in you. The Bible was a new book. I found paradise. Oh, and that guy changed the world. He was as brave as anything. You know, God was behind it. But man, you know, God used that guy in an amazing way. So, you know, I, I, I found that interesting. Um, for instance, um, you know, it's wonderfully simple. Um, I, I, I love the statement of Ellen White where she says, no one can empty themselves of self. That's our big problem, self. <laughs> a big problem. No one can empty themselves of self. All they can do is consent for God to do the work. So that's all we can do. And then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart. I can't even give my heart. You shape it. You mould it. You know, see the grace there? The grace. Right? So all I can do, all you can do, is choose to allow God into our life. Yeah. Do it. And that's, anyone can do that. A child can do that. 
See, it's a choice. And why don't people do it? You know, we go uptown near Warren, we don't see people rushing towards us. They should be, don't, shouldn't they? But it, it says that man loves sin and hates righteousness. Right? We love sin, but sin will destroy us. It will. It will destroy us. It's madness, isn't it? It really is madness. But, you know, this um, couple of statements here, Jesus came into the world to save all who would accept him. And the blessing of salvation is for every soul. Nothing but his own choice or her own choice can prevent any from becoming partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. It's a choice. It's all we can do. We can choose. Jesus, I choose you. I want you in my life. Make your home in my heart, you know? That's what we can do. And Satan knows, uh, patriarchs, no, no, it's prophets and kings. Satan knows that those who ask God for pardon and grace will obtain it. Right? If we ask, we will obtain it. Isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful. So you're right. So how can we know if we're born again? We ask, right? Now, like I said, if you give me your email, I can send you that and it shows you the difference. It's really good. But when, when we were in London after that tour, um, I, I went to a bookshop and I bought this book, The Wonders of Grace. Oh, I love the name, The Wonders of Grace. And all it is is stories about people in this particular church who <coughs> were born again and accepted the gospel and became church members. Now, in that book, um, or in the book that talked about this experience, now, in this particular church, the uh, person who wanted to get baptised, the elder would interview them and ask, the, ask this question, what reason have you to believe that you are a child of God? Now, I wish our church would do that. You know, or maybe it does, I don't know, I don't do it anyway, but um, it's a very good question to ask. Now, this is a 14-year-old girl, 14-year-old girl, just a young girl, and um, how she answered this, she said, um, because I have the witness of the Spirit. Now, this is really interesting. I have the witness of the Spirit. You remember Romans 8, where it says, is it verse 16, um, the witness of the Spirit? What is the witness of the Spirit? And so she says, showing me my own nothingness, and sinfulness and the all-sufficient fullness of Jesus, my Saviour. I just think that's a brilliant answer. So the witness of the Spirit in our life will show us our sinfulness and it will show us the all-sufficiency of Jesus. You know, that's the witness of the Spirit. If we have the witness of the Spirit and those things go together, they go together. Um, for instance, um, the person who has the most grace is most conscious of their need of more grace. So the more grace that's in their life that God's working in, the more we will feel the need for more. You see? You see what I'm saying? Right? Now you might think it's the other way, but it's not. See, the more that the Spirit is in our life, the more we crave for Jesus, the Spirit of God, to work in our life. That's how it works. See, this verse here, I've got it, Psalm 63. This is David. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Right? My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. See? Right. And you know what you and I have to ask is that our experience you know, do our actions demonstrate that right. so so yeah the more you have the more you will want right. that's how it works um, and why for instance the man or woman that God is leading will be dissatisfied with themselves because we have the picture of the perfect man and we want to be like that, right? It'd be wonderful to be like Jesus. Yeah, we would. Um, 
This is a book, Practical Christianity, um, I think it's Arthur Pink. It says, the marks of regeneration, a grieving over sin, a hunting after righteousness, a panting for communion with God, a praying for a fuller conformity into Christ. Has the world lost its charm? Are, are you out of love with yourself? Is the Lamb of God a desirable object in your eyes? Right, so they're good questions to ask. They're really good questions to ask ourselves. See, the Beatitudes, they are the signs that we are the children of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, we realise our poverty and that makes us meek. Yeah. And, you know, we seek for righteousness. That's how it goes. Right, oh, now... Um, how do we grow in Christ? So this is the last section here to talk about. And uh, anyone that's married or been married, um, it takes effort to have a good relationship. Right? What, what are the things you've got to do? You've got to do to have a good relation, good marriage. What do you got to do? Uh, this is three main things really. You've got to listen to each other, don't you? You've got to talk to each other and you've got to do things together. Right? You've got to do those three things. The more, you know, when you're, when you're courting, you know, you do plenty of that. And then you have a good relationship, don't you? Right? That's how it works. And it's the same in the Christian life. I, um, I never read a book before I became a Christian. I've read a few since. But uh, um, I never read the Bible, never read anything. Yeah, I dodged every book at school. I, I didn't do that well at school. Uh, I went there to play sport. Um, I was good at running and I enjoyed playing rugby and so on and the boxing tournament and all that. <laughs> but um, when I became a Christian, um, I read this statement. And it says, great controversy, Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Therefore, he invents every possible device to engross the mind. Oh, that's so true, isn't it? That is so true. Satan does that. Now, I took that to heart. Now, I've been a builder most of my life, so I would have to leave home 7 o'clock. You know, I'd get up half past five or, you know, and I'd spend an hour reading the Bible, reading Desire of Ages, you know, trying to get it into me, you know, trying to work on that relationship. See, you've got to do that. It takes effort, you know. It does take effort. Any relationship takes effort. You're going to have a good marriage or you're going to have a good relationship with your children or with anyone. It takes effort. It does. Read those. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the question that you have to ask, and I have to ask, do you enjoy reading the word of God? Is it a daily thing that's happening in your life? Right? Only you can answer that. Right? Is prayer meaningful in your life? Right? Is it meaningful in my life? Now the great thing about it, so whatever our need, you come to God. Now, if you have no desire for the Word of God, you come to Jesus and seek Him for grace. Lord, give me the desire. It's according to your will. If we pray anything according to His will, He hears us. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Whatever our need, yeah. you know? Whatever our need. Oh, I love that, you know? Now, um, the other thing is, though, you've got to do things you do things with Jesus in the Christian life you've got to do. Right? Right? Any relationship, that's how it works. It's so simple. Now, um, it says, Christ's object lessons, all those who receive the gospel message into the heart will long to proclaim it. Will long to proclaim it. Do you long to proclaim it? Do I long to proclaim it? You know, you've got to, you know, are we real? You know, we can kill ourselves. But wouldn't it be terrible to wake up in the wrong resurrection? You know, we've got to be real with ourselves. Um, see, no matter what condition we're in, we can pray about it, you know? And, and, and the Christian life is not, it's going upstream. It's easy to go downstream, 
So it's going to be really hard going downstream because in the end, everyone that's lost will wish they'd never been born. They will. That's what the Bible says. You know. Now, let me read you this. Um, go to work, whether you feel like it or not. Engage in personal effort to bring souls to Jesus and the knowledge of truth. In, um, in such labour, you will find a stimulus and tonic. It will both arouse and strengthen. By exercising your spiritual powers, will become more vigorous, so that you will, um, so you can, with better success, work out your salvation. Um, so we're helping in this process by getting involved in the Christian witness. You know, we can't all do the same things as Bible in school. There's all sorts of things that we can get involved in, you know. But we must, you know. For instance, um, there's my other bit here. The more, um, the more he seeks to impart light, the more light he will receive. The more one tries to explain the word of God to others, with love for souls, the plainer it becomes to himself. The more we use our knowledge and exercise our power, the more knowledge and power we shall have. Every effort made for Christ will erect on blessings upon ourselves. If we use our means for his glory, he will give us more. All right. And then uh, the the Apostles, it says it is a universal principle that whatever one refuses to use their God-given powers, these powers decay and perish. Truth that is not lit, not imparted, loses its life-giving power, its healing virtue. Right. We're doing, you know, the greatest thing, even just for ourselves, by sharing the gospel. We really are. We really are. Yeah, it's just the law of health. I mean, life. You know, I fell off a roof. I've been a builder. I fell off a roof and smashed my back up um, about thirty odd years ago, and I had to lay on um, a bed for two and a half weeks. Now I could hardly walk when I, um, they got me up. It was a real struggle to walk. So what you don't use, you lose. If you don't use your body, if you don't exercise your body, you will slowly lose it. Right? You will. Right? So it's the same in the Christian life. You know, we have this wonderful message, the gospel. You know, the gospel, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It's hope for this world. Here. You know, the illustration like um, a house is burning and there's people in there, and you can do something to save them. You know, and if we don't do it, it's it's wrong. It's morally wrong not to do it. You know. Now it's a challenge in this world. But we pray, we pray for grace, and God helps us. You know, God is for us. You know. Now, if you don't do anything about it, I mean, about sharing your faith, you know, seeking God through His Word, through prayer, and sharing, I don't think you'll be in the kingdom of God. I don't think you will be. Actually, um, I've got a statement here where she says that. You know, um, so. Yeah, this is his. People, it's, no, it's, it's testimonies one, 500 million. People will be lost because they didn't work for souls. But it's a work for, um, for souls, blood of the poor sinners on their souls. Now, that's a, that's a challenging statement, isn't it? You know? <clears throat> Who is sufficient for that? So, it's just um, to grow like the children's story. You've got to feed, you've got to exercise. It's that simple. It really is that simple. But it takes a lot of effort, you know. Now, the last thing I... I um, well, actually, I was going to... Um, this verse here. Um, there's three words in there um, to do. So if we're not doing these things, remember. And it says repent. And it says do. Right? Remember, repent, and do. Right? Those three things that's um, really important.
So repentance, the proof of repentance is a changed life. So now this thought here, I just want to finish with this thought. You know, in the Bible it says in the New Testament 77 times to repent. But you can't. You can't. Or you can, you know. See, it's a gift. It's a gift from God. God gives repentance. It's amazing in the Bible it tells us to do things we can't do. But only as we come to God that we can do them. So here's another example. Talking about knowing God, knowledge of God. Right? This is life eternal that they might know him. Right? But without God, we can't know him. Right? But look at the promise here. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. See? Wonderful, isn't it? See, and here's just the last example. Cast, or, you know, it talks to you about um, get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. We can't do it. We can't do it. But see, is it, you, so for every command in the Bible, there's a promise. Right? It's holy of grace. Through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? Good. I just want to um, finish with this. Um, I, I read this. Um, this is really good. No matter where you're at, you know, no matter where you're at, God is for you. He loves you. He died for you. It's, you know, I, I love going up town and sharing the gospel with people. And I look a person in the eye, you know, and I say, you know, Jesus died for you as though you were the only one. If you were the only one, he would have died for you. Isn't that amazing? For me, he would have done that just for me. For you. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? So it doesn't matter where we are, come to Jesus, talk to him, read his word. But let me read you this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Even even the cheap, Jesus came into the world to save you. Only trust him and rest in him. I will tell you that you ought to, to fetch you to Christ. Uh, no, I will tell you what ought to fetch you to Christ at once is the thought of his amazing love. And this is just an illustration of it's wonderful. A, a wicked son had been a great grief to his father. He had robbed him and disgraced him and at last ended by bringing his grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. He was a horrible wretch of a son. No one could have been more graceless. However, uh, he attended his father's funeral and he stayed to hear the reading of the will. Perhaps it was the chief reason why he was there. He had fully made up his mind that his father would cut him off with a shun and he meant to make it very unpleasant for the rest of the family. To his great astonishment, um, as the will was read, it, it ran something like this. As for my son Richard, though he has fearfully wasted my substance, and though he has grieved, often grieved my heart, I would have him to know that I consider him still to be my own dear child. Therefore, in token of his undying love, I leave him the same share as the rest of the brothers. He left the room. He couldn't stand it. The surprised love of his father had mastered him. He came down to the lawyer the next morning and said, You surely didn't read it correctly. Yes, I did. There it stands. Then he said, I feel ready to curse myself that I ever grieved my dear old father. Oh, that I could fetch him back again. Love was born in that base heart by unexpected display of love. May not your case be similar of our Lord Jesus Christ is dead, but he has left his will with the chief of sinners, the object of his choicest mercy. Dying, he prayed, Father, I forgive them. Risen, he pleads for transgressions. Sinners are ever on his mind. Their, trans uh, their salvation is his great object. His blood is for them. His heart is for them. His righteousness is for them. His heaven is for them. Come, O oh, you guilty ones, and receive your legacy. Put out the hand of faith and grasp 
your portion. Trust Jesus with your soul and you will be saved. Amen. Isn't that good? Isn't God good? Praise God. You know, live the, the Christian life is impossible on our own, but with God, all things are possible. God bless you.